Good day, friends. Welcome to my channel. Dear students or learners, I'm going to discuss the first set of topics uh, under the subject TP16, the child and adolescent learners and learning principles. So dear students or learners, after watching this video, you are expected to explain the basic concepts related to child and adolescent development and explain how current research and theories on child and adolescent development contribute to teaching and learning within and across different areas. So why is it that the pre-service teachers should know or should learn about the learning principles about the child and adolescent learners? So there are 10 reasons. The first one is understanding developmental stages. Knowing the different stages of child and adolescent development helps pre-service teachers design age-appropriate learning experiences. This knowledge ensures that teaching methods and materials are suitable for the developmental level of their students promoting effective learning. Next is creating exclusive learning environments. Awareness of developmental milestones and variations allows teachers to accommodate <clears throat> diverse learning needs. Pre-service teachers can better support students with, with different abilities and backgrounds, fostering an inclusive classroom environment. Next reason is supporting individual growth. Understanding the unique characteristics of child and adolescent development helps teachers identify and support the individual growth and needs of their students. This knowledge enables teachers to provide personalized instruction and interventions. Next is enhancing communication. Effective, um, effective communication with students requires an understanding of their cognitive, emotional, and social development. Pre-service teachers who are knowledgeable about these aspects can interact more effectively and build stronger relationships with their students. Next one is promoting emotional and social well-being. Awareness of social emotional development helps teachers recognize and address the emotional and social challenges students may face. This understanding is crucial for creating a supportive and safe learning environment. Next is applying developmental theories. Familiarity with developmental theories and research allows pre-service teachers to apply evidence-based practices in their teaching. Integrating theoretical knowledge with practical strategies enhances the overall quality of education. The next reason is informing classroom management. Knowledge of developmental stages and characteristics informs classroom management strategies. Uh, Pre-service teachers can develop appropriate expectations and disciplinary approaches that are developmentally appropriate. Next reason is supporting lifelong learning. Understanding the principles of child and adolescent development helps pre-service teachers instill a love for learning and critical uh, thinking skills in their students. Uh, this foundation is essential for fostering lifelong learners. Next is collaboration with parents and guardians. Pre-service teachers who understand 
child and adolescent development can communicate more effectively with parents and guardians. This collaboration supports students' growth and development, both at school and at home. And the last one is professional growth. Gaining knowledge about child and adolescent learners is part of the professional development of pre-service teachers. It prepares them to meet the challenges of the teaching profession and enhances their effectiveness as educators. By comprehensive understanding uh, the child and adolescent development, pre-service teachers are better equipped to create engaging, supportive, and effective learning environments that cater to the holistic development of their students. Now, let's start with the basic concepts. So we have here uh, definitions of child and adolescent learners, growth and development, periods of development, developmental tasks and education, domains of development, context and development, and lastly, development and pedagogy. So let's start with the definition of child and adolescent learners. Okay, so um, here are the definitions from the famous organizations. So for those who do not know these organizations yet, so let me introduce them. UNESCO. UNESCO stands for the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. It is a specialized agency of the United Nations aimed at promoting world peace and security through international cooperation in education, the sciences, and culture. UNESCO works to foster collaboration among nations to contribute to sustainable development and intercultural dialogue. Its programs include initiatives to promote quality education for all, preserve cultural heritage, support scientific research, and advocate for freedom of expression. UNICEF stands for the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund, now officially the United Nations Children's Fund. It is a United Nations agency responsible for providing humanitarian and developmental aid to children worldwide. Established in 1946 to provide emergency food and health care to children in countries that had been devastated by World War II. UNICEF now focuses on long-term needs such as education, nutrition, immunization, and protection from violence and exploitation. Its mission is to advocate for the rights of children, ensuring they grow up in safe, healthy, and nurturing environments. WHO. So what is WHO? So WHO stands for the World Health Organization. It is a specialized agency of the United Nations responsible for international public health. Um, established in 1948, WHO works to ensure the highest possible level of health for all people. The, organi the organization directs and coordinates international health efforts, monitors health trends, provides technical support to countries, and set, uh, sets global health standards. WHO initiatives include disease prevention and control, health system strengthening, emergency response, and promoting overall well-being through various health-related programs and policies. Okay. Now, now that you are, uh, for those who are not aware of these organizations, so I have introduced them, and let's delve into the definitions given by these uh, very important organizations. So let's start with the uh, UNESCO. So UNESCO defines, okay, 
UNESCO take note of this um, paragraph, that the definition of the UNESCO. UNESCO defines children as individuals below the age of 18 who are in the formative stages of development. This definition highlights the crucial period of growth and learning that occurs before adulthood. UNESCO's focus emphasizes the importance of providing appropriate educational opportunities, resources, and support to meet the developmental and educational needs of children. This definition underscores the role of education in shaping young minds and preparing them for future challenges, advocating for policies and practices that ensure all children have all children have access to quality education and the tools necessary for holistic development. Let's have the definition of the UNICEF. UNICEF defines children as those as those under 18 years old, focusing on the rights, needs for protection, and the importance of nurturing their potential. This definition is grounded in the principles of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which emphasizes that children require special care and protection due to their vulnerability. UNICEF's definition advocates for safeguarding children's rights to survival, development, protection from harm, and participation in decisions affecting their lives. It underscores the necessity of creating environments where children can thrive, highlighting the importance of both immediate needs and long-term potential. Lastly, we have the definition, the definition from WHO. So the World Health Organization defines children and adolescents as individuals in their developmental phase until they reach the age of 18. This definition focuses on health, well-being, and developmental milestones, recognizing the various physical, cognitive, and emotional changes that occur during this period. WHO's definition stresses the importance of addressing the health needs of children and adolescents through appropriate medical care, nutrition, and psychosocial support. It underscores the critical role of health in enabling young people to achieve their full developmental potential, advocating for comprehensive health services tailored to their unique needs. So these definitions highlight the broad scope of developmental needs and rights that must be addressed within educational settings settings let's have the growth and development nature or nurture so let's have the nature nature refers to the genetic and biological factors that influence an individual's growth and development this perspective emphasizes the role of inherited traits and the genetic blueprint in shaping physical and cognitive aspects of development. For instance, the physical characteristics like height, eye color, and susceptibility to certain diseases are largely determined by genetics. Similarly, cognitive, cognitive abilities and talents can also have genetic basis. Understanding nature's role helps educators and parents recognize the inherent potentials and limitations of each child, thereby guiding more effective support for their natural aptitudes and developmental pathways. Let's have the nurture. Nurture encompasses the environmental influences that impact an individual's development, including family, culture, education, and life experiences. 
This perspective highlights how external factors and the learning environment contribute significantly to shaping developmental outcomes. For example, a child's, a child's language development can be heavily influenced by the written, uh, richness, richness of the linguistic environment they are exposed to at home and in school. Similarly, social skills and emotional well-being are often shaped by interactions with family, peers, and educators. Recognizing the role of nurture emphasizes the importance of creating supportive and enriching environments to foster optimal development. Both nature and nurture play integral roles in shaping learners. Understanding this interaction helps educators tailor their approaches to meet diverse needs. Let's have the periods of development. So the development is divided into distinct stages. So start with the infancy. So from zero to two years. Infancy spanning from birth to two years is characterized by rapid physical and sensory development. During this period, infants experience significant growth in height and weight and their sensory abilities, such as vision and hearing, develop quickly. Uh, foundational cognitive skills also begin to emerge, um, including object permanence and early problem solving abilities. Socially, infants form infants form strong emotional bonds with caregivers through attachment, which is crucial for their emotional security and social development. This uh, stage sets the groundwork for future learning and development as infants explore their environment and begin to understand the world around them. Next stage is early childhood from three to six years. Okay, three to six years. So early childhood, three to six years, is marked by the development of, of motor skills language and social abilities. Children in this stage refine their gross and fine motor skills, enabling activities like running, drawing, and using utensils. Language development accelerates with children expanding their vocabulary and grasping grammar, facilitating more complex communication. Socially, they begin to form friendships, understand social norms, and develop empathy. This period is also crucial for imaginative play, which supports cognitive development and problem-solving skills. Early childhood lays a foundation for academic learning and social competence. Next stage is the middle childhood, seven to 11 years. Middle childhood, involves significant cognitive advancements, increased learning, and enhanced social interactions. Children in this stage develop logical thinking skills, allowing them to perform more complex mental operations, such as classification and seriation. Academic skills, particularly in reading, writing, and mathematics, grows substantially. Socially, peer relationships become more important and children learn to navigate group dynamics, cooperation, and conflict resolution. This period is also characterized by the development of self-concept and self-esteem, influenced by both academic achievements and social experiences. A next stage is adolescence, 12 to 18 years. 
So adolescence encompasses puberty, identity formation, and complex cognitive and emotional development. Physical changes during puberty include growth spurts and the development of secondary sexual characteristics. Cognitively, adolescents develop abstract thinking, problem solving, and reasoning abilities, moving beyond concrete thinking. Emotionally, this period involves ident identity exploration. As adolescents seek to understand who they are and their place in the world, peer relationships deepen and the influence of friends becomes more pronounced. Adolescents also begin to develop independence from their parents, preparing for adult roles and responsibilities. Recognizing these periods helps educators design age-appropriate learning experiences. Let's have the developmental tasks and education. So for those of you who are not familiar with this educator, with his name, so this is the guide. It, it His name, the pronunciation of his name is Havig Hurst. Okay, Havig Hurst. So for those who do not know him yet, let me introduce him. So Robert G. Havig Hurst was an American professor, physicist, educator, and expert on aging. Born in 1900s and passing in 1991, he's best known for his work in developmental psychology and education. Having Hurst developed the concept of developmental tasks, which are specific achievements and milestones that individuals are, are expected to accomplish at five stages of their life. These tasks are important for a successful development and include physical, cognitive, social, and emotional aspects. Having Hurts, Havig Hurst's developmental tasks framework spans across different life stages, including infancy, childhood, adolescence, early adulthood, middle age, and old age. His work emphasized the interaction between biology and environment in development aligning with the nature versus nurture deeping. Having Hearst's contributions have had a significant impact on education, providing insights into age-appropriate learning and teaching practices that align with developmental milestones. Okay, so Having Hearst identified um, key developmental tasks that individuals must master at different life stages. So let's start with the infancy and early childhood. Okay, so during infancy and early childhood, that is zero to six years, key developmental tasks include learning to walk, talk, and control, bodily functions. Infants and toddlers achieve motor milestones such as sitting, crawling, and walking, which are essential for exploring the environment. Language development progresses from babbling to forming simple words and sentences. Additionally, children start to gain control over bodily functions, such as toilet training. These milestones are foundational for further cognitive and social development as they allow children to interact more effectively with their surroundings and caregivers, setting the stage for future learning and independence. Next is the middle childhood. In middle childhood, that is 7 to 11 years, 
children focus on developing uh, developing attitudes towards uh, toward themselves and others and learning to cooperate. This stage is marked by an increase in cognitive abilities and self-awareness. Children begin to form self-concepts and self-esteem based on their achievements and social interactions. They also learn to navigate social relationships, developing skills such as cooperation, empathy, and conflict resolution. This period is crucial for establishing positive attitudes towards school, peers, and authority figures, which influences their social competence and academic success as they transition to adolescence. Next is, lastly, we have the adolescence. So during adolescence, that is 12 to 18 years, Individuals work on achieving emotional independence, developing a sense of identity, and preparing for adult roles. Puberty brings significant physical and hormonal changes, prompting adolescents to explore their own identity and values. They seek independence from their parents and strive to establish their own beliefs, goals, and personal identity. This period is characterized by a deepening of peer relationships and the uh, exploration of future roles in education and career. Successfully navigating these tasks helps adolescents transition into adulthood with a clearer sense of self and readiness for adult responsibilities. Education should align with these tasks to support learners successful progression through developmental stages. Now, let's have the domains of development. So what is a domain? A domain refers to a distinct area or aspect of development that encompasses specific types of growth and functioning. In the context of human development, Domains are categorized into biological, cognitive, and socio-emotional aspects. Now let's start with the biological. Biological. Okay, so the biological domain encompasses the physical growth, motor skills, and health. It includes the development of physical characteristics such as height, weight, and overall health. Motor skills development involves the refinement of coordination and movement abilities from basic reflexes in infancy to complex physical skills in later stages. This domain is foundational because it influences other areas of development. For example, physical health can impact cognitive function while motor skills development affects social interaction and exploration. Understanding biological development helps educators support children's physical needs and recognize how physical changes can influence learning and behavior. Next, let's have the cognitive domain. The cognitive domain involves intellectual abilities such as thinking, learning, and problem solving. It includes processes like memory, reasoning, and comprehension, which are essential for academic success and cognitive growth. This domain encompasses the development of skills such as attention, perception, and language, which facilitate learning and knowledge acquisition. Cognitive de development is crucial as it underpins a child's ability to understand and interact with the world solve problems and make decisions. Educators focus on this domain to design appropriate learning experiences that challenge and support cognitive development, uh, fostering critical thinking and problem solving skills. And lastly, let's have the social emotional domain. The social emotional domain involves the development of emotions social interactions, and personality. 
it includes how individuals understand and manage their own emotions, build relationships with others, and develop a sense of self. This domain is critical for fostering positive relationships and emotional well-being. It influences how learners interact with peers, respond to social cues, and navigate emotional challenges. Understanding social emotional development helps educators create supportive environments that promote emotional intelligence, social skills, and resilience. Addressing this domain ensures that learners develop healthy self-concepts and effective interpersonal skills, contributing to their overall well-being and academic success. Okay, so let's have the context and development. Right, so con uh, contextual factors such as family dynamics, cultural backgrounds and socioeconomic status profoundly influence a child's development. Educators must recognize these elements to tailor their teaching approaches effectively. By understanding and integrating these diverse contexts, educators can create inclusive learning environments that respect and support each student's unique background. This approach ensures that all learners receive the support they need to thrive academically and personally, acknowledging that development is shaped by a complex interplay of personal and environmental factors. Okay. Now, let's have the hats, questions, and answers. So these questions will help you to attain the learning objectives that I have presented at, at the very start. Okay, let's start with the question one. Analyze how understanding the developmental milestones of infancy can impact a teacher's approach to classroom activities for young children. Provide specific examples. So this is the answer. Understanding developmental milestones in infancy, such as sensory development and early cognitive skills, allows teachers to tailor classroom activities to be age appropriate. For example, Knowing that infants develop object permanence around 8 to 12 months can lead teachers to include activities that involve hide and seek games with objects to enhance cognitive skills. By aligning activities with developmental milestones, teachers can create engaging and supportive learning environments that cater to the developmental needs of young children fostering both the cognitive and social growth. Question number two, evaluate the role of social emotional development in shaping a child's ability to interact effectively in group settings. How can teachers support this aspect of development in their classrooms? So this is the answer. Social emotional development is crucial for a child's ability to interact in group settings as it influences their emotional intelligence, empathy, and social skills. Teachers can support this aspect by implementing cooperative learning activities, role-playing exercises, and providing opportunities for students to express their feelings. For instance, group projects and peer feedback sessions can help students practice communication and empathy. Additionally, creating a classroom environment where positive social interactions are encouraged and celebrated promotes social emotional development, aiding students in forming 
healthy relationships and managing social challenges effectively. Question number three, synthesize the contributions of Vygotsky's social cultural theory, theory and Piaget's cognitive development theory to modern educational practices. How can these theories be integrated to enhance teaching strategies? So this is the answer. By Gotsky's social-cultural theory emphasizes the role of social interactions and cultural context in cognitive development, suggesting that learning occurs through guided interaction within the zone of proximal development. Piaget's cognitive development theory focuses on stages of cognitive growth and the importance of active learning. Integrating these theories involves using collaborative learning activities that align with Vygotsky's concepts while designing tasks that are developmentally appropriate as per Piaget's stages. For instance, teachers can use peer tutoring and group discussions to provide scaffold, uh, scaffolded support. And that is by Vygotsky. While ensuring that tasks challenge students at their appropriate cognitive level, and that is by PHA, thereby enhancing overall teaching strategies. Okay. Question number four. Assess how understanding the interaction between nature and nurture influences educational practices. Provide examples of how this knowledge can be applied in the classroom. So answer, understanding the interaction between nature and nurture helps educators design more personalized and effective teaching strategies. Recognizing that both genetic predispositions and environmental factors influence learning. Okay, recognizing that both genetic predispositions and, environment, and environmental factors influence learning allows teachers to create supportive environments that cater to individual needs. For example, a student with a natural aptitude for mathematics might benefit from advanced problem-solving tasks, while a student who struggles with math might receive additional support and practice opportunities. By acknowledging both aspects, educators can provide differentiated instruction that addresses each student's unique developmental profile, promoting a better learning outcomes and accommodating diverse needs. So dear uh, friends, students, learners, thank you for watching. Uh, if you, if some of you, or if you are new to my channel, please give a like and comment and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you very much for listening. May God bless you all. Bye. May God bless you.